Welcome everyone to this traffic safety webinar sponsored by the North Carolina Governor's Highway Safety Program. This is one in a series of webinars addressing topics of interest for traffic safety professionals. The series is co-hosted by the Institute for Transportation Research and Education at North Carolina State University and the University of North Carolina Highway Safety Research Center. Today's topic is North Carolina Court Decisions, Recent DWI-Related Cases, presented by Ike Avery with the North Carolina Conference of District Attorneys. It's my pleasure to welcome Sarah Garner, also with the Conference of District Attorneys, who will introduce Ike. Sarah? Thank you, Jane. Can everyone hear, can you hear me okay? Yes. Right. <clears throat> Y'all, it is my express pleasure to introduce to you my friend, Ike Avery. Ike has been an attorney for 47 years. And you can see here from his bio, he has dedicated his life to making things better and safer for us here in the state of North Carolina. And in fact, pretty much all the traffic law that we have, I was instrumental in some way, shape or form. Folks, if you're doing research or you're looking at a case and it's good case law, if you will look down to see who it was from the AG's office that made it happen in front of the Court of Appeals, that would have been Ike Avery. At any rate, there's nobody better to give us a case law update than Ike because he lives it, breathes it, and in fact understands it and can explain it very well to us. And uh, the most wonderful thing is I get to see him live on the hook tomorrow and I'm so excited I can't stand it. So anyway, I, with no further ado, educate us. Sarah, thank you. I go ahead and share your screen. Uh, you want to, yes, okay. Uh, I am uh, attempting to share my screen. Here we go. All right, hopefully everybody sees that. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Um, there are lots of interesting cases that have come out since the uh, first of the years when uh, I went back to that, including some that came out today. So uh, we'll go through this. Uh, please ask any questions uh, through the Q&A and, &A and uh, uh, if you uh, need copies of this, of course, you'll get a copy of the recording. Uh, but if you want any of these PowerPoint slides, just send me an email. My contact information will be there. Well, the first one we're going to look at is checking station. Uh, Justin Philbeck, one of our regional TSRPs at the conference, actually prosecuted this case out in the western part of the state. And it's a great case uh, because, as we know, uh, we have uh, social media and they're not always in favor of law enforcement. <clears throat> so in this case, troopers set up a checking station. Uh, they followed the procedures that the highway patrol has that uh, I know you prosecutors have seen. And they had the authorization form from the supervisor, the HP 14, uh, that uh, they did it just like they do all the others. <clears throat> blue light was on on the vehicle, every vehicle was stopped, every driver was asked the same information, look for signs of impairment. The only difference on this one was because of social media, every 30 minutes they moved the location, okay? Uh, and the uh, question was, uh, is this uh, valid under our uh, law? And the Court of Appeals said it was, and <clears throat> they attacked it based upon moving the checking station. They said somehow that changes it from a DWI checking station or a chapter 20 checking station to something else. <clears throat> and therefore it was unreasonable. Uh, the court of appeals said uh, that the lower court, the superior court had properly determined it was a valid programmatic purpose and the moving of the checking station didn't uh, make any difference in that determination and upheld it. Uh, when I was talking with Justin about this case, <clears throat> we came up with this list of suggested best practices if you're going to do this. Now, I don't know how you're going to do it if you have the uh, Batmobile. Uh, I mean, that's a lot of stuff to move. <clears throat> uh, but I guess you could move the checking station uh, if you got close by and the Batmobile doesn't have to be right on site. But in any event, if it's not a Batmobile type checking station, uh, then the best thing is, is if you think that uh, the uh, social media will put you out of business because they'll start reporting it to all the bars and everything is to uh, plan in advance and put it as part of your plan uh, that you intend to move it. Uh, and where are you going to move it? 
and select the location. If that doesn't happen, if suddenly you see that, hey, we don't have any cars coming through here, <clears throat> can we still move it even though we didn't plan to? Uh, I think you can uh, if the supervisor of the checking station is the one who makes the decision, not the individual officers. And then if there's supervisory approval, uh, either in advance or at the time, uh, to move it to another location. Of course, prosecutors, you know that if they move them, uh, that's going to be an issue. But this case does indicate that just moving it should not change the basic nature of the checking station, should not make it unconstitutional. Uh, it's just officers, you know, as well as uh, prosecutors know, uh, on checking stations, you have to document, have to have it set down somewhere, and you have to be prepared for a long day in district court. <clears throat> but moving the checking station is authorized, and with ways and other uh, social media, we may have to do that more than we did in the past, okay? In this case, the Mackey case also, which is the published opinion uh, prosecutors, which means it, uh, it's good uh, to cite in district court, of course, uh, the unpublished R2, you just have to give copies of it, uh, but they challenged the constitutionality based upon right to freedom of travel under the, uh, which is uh, guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. Uh, but the court said that's not what the freedom of travel means. It means, you know, people have a right to move from one state to another state. Doesn't mean that you can't check people with a checking station. So they threw that out. And also they alleged a denial of equal protection under the 14th Amendment because uh, they're the provision in the statute that says you can't challenge uh, by motion uh, the location of the checking station, they rejected that also. So uh, if they still making that in trial court, uh, this is a good case because it kind of did away with us. This steel case came down, you can see the end of April, and it's an interesting case. I'm sure it's going to the US, uh, the North Carolina Supreme Court because it's a two to one decision. And if in the Court of Appeals, if the, there's a dissent from the uh, majority opinion, the uh, losing party has a right to appeal to the Supreme Court as a matter of right. Uh, this occurred down at East Carolina. An ECU officer uh, was dispatched um, to uh, a crash. Uh, he went in his marked car uh, and he uh, started heading that way. And of course, it's about 2.50 a.m. So they're not uh, not a whole lot of good happens at 2.50 a.m., I guess, but he saw a vehicle, so he was thinking maybe this individual was involved in this because there are not a whole lot of vehicles uh, out at this time. So he started following this Camaro. Uh, he uh, uh, appeared to have his running daylights on, but not his headlights. <clears throat> but in any event, uh, they followed it around. You can see from the facts there. They pulled in on campus parking uh, and it was empty except for them. So as they, once they're in the parking lot, the uh, Camaro turns around and starts out. The uh, uh, officer pulled close to him and basically waved to him out his door uh, to stop. Uh, just waved at him. Uh, the, the guy in the Camaro pulls over. Uh, the officer did not activate his blue lights or his siren. Uh, the officer began speaking to the driver and immediately determined the guy had been drinking and obviously appeared to be impaired uh, and uh, then arrested him uh, and uh, for DWI. The majority said that this was a seizure as opposed to a voluntary encounter. Okay, so two judges said it's a seizure. They said uh, uh, that it's unique. He was hailed by a law enforcement officer while driving in a separate vehicle, as opposed to walking down the street. They had uh, basically admitted that if he'd been walking down the street and the officer waved to him and it was not going to be a seizure, but because they're in cars, suddenly it becomes a seizure. <clears throat> uh, and they said they didn't find a case directly on point. There are four cases. There they are. Uh, if you want uh, uh, to look them up on voluntary encounters based upon officers just approaching people. Uh, and none of them are where both of them are in the car. The bottom one, Wilson, was where he was not in the car. But he was standing 
he got out of his uh, vehicle, saw a guy leaving a location, and he just wanted to find out if somebody they were looking for lived there. So he waved to the guy uh, who brought his uh, truck over there and stopped, and the officer noticed he was impaired. And the North Carolina Supreme Court affirmed per curiam, meaning the whole court without a, an author of the opinion, uh, affirmed that this was not a seizure, this was a voluntary encounter. Well, the majority distinguished all of these cases in saying because none of them, both people were in a car, that they don't control, okay? Because they have to follow the other cases if they do control. The dissent, uh, the majority said uh, that the difference in these cases, in fact, the encounter was two moving vehicles. It was late at night, uh, location, and he hailed him using an authoritative gesture, which means he waved at him, okay? The majority, I think, stumbled a little bit because in trying to emphasize their position, they said, had the defendant not stopped, it, he could have been charged with resist, obstruct, or delay, which you know you can't do that if it's if he didn't have reasonable suspicion. First of all, it couldn't be resist, obstruct, or delay because it has to be a valid law enforcement function. And we all know that if you just wave to somebody and they just continue to drive, you're not going to charge them with resist, obstruct, or delay. But that's what the majority said in any event. <clears throat> we'll see if the North Carolina Supreme Court will fix that. The dissent uh, basically went through all four cases and said they all fit this particular uh, scenario uh, and uh, asserted how the public should cooperate with law enforcement. Uh, and uh, it's, it's all voluntary here, uh, but it's something that we ought to be encouraging. So I think that at some point, uh, the North Carolina Supreme Court will get this case and we'll get to see it again. But officers just know if you're in the car and uh, somebody else is in another car and you wave to them to get to stop, they're going to call up this case and uh, claim that uh, that was a seizure and not a voluntary encounter. Okay. The Honeycutt case, uh, I just put it in there because I don't know how many wildlife officers we have on this webinar. Uh, but this is unique to wildlife because they have certain statutes because it's a regulatory uh, function of hunting and they have statutory uh, authority to stop vehicles here. They knew the guy was a convicted felon, shouldn't be possessing a firearm uh, and got tips that he was out hunting and he stopped him uh, and uh, they upheld the stop. Uh, other than wildlife officers, uh, other law enforcement officers cannot use the wildlife statutes to uh, uh, as justification for stops. <laughs> this is an interesting case. A uh, trooper who was at, uh, I guess, a motor carrier <clears throat> section of the highway patrol uh, because he was uh, um, got tips from uh, several people about this guy who was driving from Calpins, South Carolina to uh, um, Newport News, Virginia in his 18-wheeler, uh, or at least his uh, commercial motor vehicle, tractor trailer, <clears throat> uh, and he knew he had to come through the way station. So when he uh, got multiple calls, he was there at the way station. He asked the uh, defendant, the driver, to pull over to the inspection lot so he could inspect his vehicle, which you can do because they're commercial motor vehicles. They're a little different than regular vehicles. Uh, the driver refused to look at the, uh, uh, the trooper didn't uh, really acknowledge him uh, and he had to ask him twice to do that uh, and then he drove over to the inspection area of the way station uh, as the uh, he drove past uh, towards the inspection uh, section the trooper did uh, uh, lean out of the window uh, to inspect the uh, tractor trailer and smell burnt marijuana and as we'll see <clears throat> we got lots of people smoking marijuana in these cases uh, when he got out of the car, he uh, the vehicle, he had wobbly and very lethargic. Uh, he had to ask him for his license three times, and he skipped over it, of course, when he's looking for it. <clears throat> so the trooper does a sobriety test. Notice he doesn't do HGN. As we'll see in other cases, HGN does not always, usually doesn't appear if the only impairing substance is marijuana. Okay, so the trooper and notice he had been on the highway patrol since 1991. So that means almost 30 years uh, <laughs> at the time. But in any event, 
Uh, he sees eight of eight clues on the walking turn, four or four clues on the one leg stand, the finger to nose, he missed it five out of six times, the Romberg balance, which you do, of course, when uh, you're dealing with marijuana, uh, he swayed and he estimated 30 seconds uh, after 46 seconds. So his internal clock was slowed down. <clears throat> uh, he testified uh, that he was familiar with uh, uh, recognizing marijuana and uh, marijuana impairment. Uh, the challenge to this uh, was that uh, uh, the uh, allowing the uh, trooper to testify that the uh, uh, sobriety tests indicated marijuana impairment because the defense argued that these sobriety tests only are designed for alcohol impairment. Now, prosecutors don't let them get away with saying that uh, unless they have proof of it. Just because the lawyer says it doesn't mean it's true. <clears throat> uh, he said it's not a reliable indicator of marijuana impairment. The Court of Appeals uh, didn't even reach the, really reach the issue. Basically what they said was, well, even if he couldn't say based upon the sobriety test, he could give his opinion uh, based upon his observations as a lay witness and cited the Streckfus case <clears throat> uh, that, the, uh, uh, that the individual was impaired uh, and what he saw on the walk and turn and the one leg stand, he can still testify what he says. He just can't uh, do it as clues and that sort of thing. <clears throat> the Court of Appeals said, assuming arguendo, meaning uh, for purposes of argument, it, that the trooper's testimony was uh, improper. There was still all kinds of other proper testimony and they upheld the conviction. Again, by doing it this way, the court didn't help us out a whole lot uh, because they didn't rule the uh, testimony was erroneous, but they didn't rule that it was appropriate. They just said, well, there's plenty of evidence that he was impaired and therefore it was harmless error if it was error. So it didn't help us out a whole lot, but it's a good case uh, if you need one on SFSTs and marijuana. <clears throat> this next case also involved the over of marijuana. Uh, Valdez police officer uh, stopped a guy for speeding. Uh, he uh, uh, thought he had bad uh, tinted windows uh, also. Uh, that were too dark, but when he gets up there, he sees that they were just electric window shades that were not tinting on the window, and so it was not illegal, even though it looks like tinting. Uh, but uh, in any event, he stopped him while he was speaking to him. He heard, smelled the slight odor of alcohol, uh, I mean, marijuana coming from the car, uh, which was covered up with some sort of cologne, okay? And as the longer he stood there, the cologne dissipated and the marijuana scent got uh, stronger. Uh, <clears throat> after uh, he got him out of his car, he did administer HGN and as I, and observed no sign of impairment. Uh, of course, again, HGN doesn't always show up, especially when it's just uh, marijuana, okay? While administering the test, uh, he did smell marijuana coming out of the car, told the defendant that, but the defendant denied it. He called for a drug dog uh, and a deputy uh, came over there, arrived within uh, 12 minutes uh, and was on the scene for eight minutes. Uh, he did alert to the car uh, while he got there. <clears throat> so uh, uh, the extension of the stop, uh, the uh, uh, defendant uh, was stopped for speeding. They said the odor of marijuana uh, coming from the car uh, was reasonable suspicion to extend the stop. And besides, by the time he wrote the warning ticket, real slowly apparently, uh, the dog had already alerted. So there was no problem with Rodriguez. We have these uh, uh, marijuana cards at the Conference of DAs and Forensic Test for Alcohol, I think still has some of them. Uh, we don't have a whole lot left, but we're gonna get some more. And with Virginia uh, supposedly going to uh, uh, legalize marijuana, uh, we're gonna see more of it. And so I would encourage all of you to officers and prosecutors, you ought to have these, uh, to take these cards because it shows what you should see uh, on a stop when an individual is uh, impaired by marijuana. 
uh, or cannabis as they call it in those legalized states. Uh, so uh, we have those cards and uh, if you'll send an email to myself or Sarah, we'll uh, see about getting you some uh, in, for your use. But the odor of marijuana uh, was grounds to extend the stop. A case that just came down this morning. Yes, I looked at them at eight o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> they came down today. They come down every uh, first and uh, third Tuesday of the month from the Court North Carolina Court of Appeals. Uh, the odor of marijuana and probable cause to search was the issue in this case. Here an officer was running a seatbelt initiative. Yeah, probably something to get points uh, through the governor's highway safety program. He noticed that the uh, uh, driver did not have a seatbelt on. So he stopped him, asked for his license and registration, noticed the odor of burnt marijuana coming from the vehicle. Okay. Uh, he decided it was uh, uh, that he'd get some uh, backup because he wanted to search the car. Uh, so uh, he uh, uh, basically went back up to the car after his backup arrived and uh, told the driver and the one passenger in there that if they turned over all their marijuana, he'd probably issue them a citation they could be released. The passenger said he had smoked a joint earlier, pulled an object out of his sock, which the officer recognized to be a partially smoked marijuana cigarette. Okay. However, the search of the vehicle occurred anyhow, so I guess we didn't let him go after we told him we would. Uh, but a search of the vehicle, they found scales, marijuana, and two kinds of Schedule I controlled substances, some sort of uh, fentanyl. Uh, the, uh, hold on a second, I'm sorry. Um, the uh, uh, question on appeal was uh, whether the odor of marijuana in and of itself is probable cause for the search, okay? The uh, officer testified that he had smelled it, et cetera. The defendant introduced this, the 2019 SBI memo in a motion to suppress, uh, which said that it's impossible to distinguish between burning marijuana and burning hemp. Hemp is legal in North Carolina. Of course, if you smoke it, nobody's gonna smoke hemp because it doesn't get you high. It, uh, <clears throat> it has very low THC in it and you won't get high smoking hemp until you, I guess, kill yourself smoking so much. But in any event, the odor of hemp, burning hemp and the odor of burning marijuana uh, are, are, cannot be distinguished. They say even drug dogs can't figure out the difference. <clears throat> so uh, the Court of Appeals held that the odor of marijuana gives the law enforcement officer probable cause. Uh, that issue may need to be re-examined, but they didn't do it today, thank goodness. They found not only did the officer have the odor of marijuana to as some justification for probable cause, he had the passenger's admission he had just smoked marijuana. So it's not hemp, it's marijuana, according to the at least the confession, and the partially smoked marijuana cigarette. They had all of that, and that justified probable cause. They did have a four circuit case, and I'm sure some of you may see it that if you can't. Uh, you can't search everybody just because one person has marijuana. You have to have particularized uh, suspicion as to uh, what may, uh, who may have drugs, et cetera. They rejected that case, said in this time, because of the way this one came up, the officers had probable cause to search the vehicle. <clears throat> so you're gonna have the uh, hemp defense come up in uh, trial. Uh, and so in order, since you know what's gonna happen, <clears throat> you need to prepare yourself. So officers, if you smell the odor of a marijuana, just know they're gonna challenge and say it's hemp. So get some more information before you do your search or arrest somebody, <clears throat> ask the driver or whoever's in the car about to smoke into the marijuana and get them to confess that they smoke marijuana just like they did in this case. And then they also look for signs of the uh, uh, impairment, even if you don't think he's appreciably impaired, if they smoked it recently, <clears throat> certain things will may appear, which will bolster the fact that it's not him, it's marijuana. 
red eyes, dilated pupils, <clears throat> have them close their eyes and the eyelid tremors is what you see in marijuana uh, impairment. Body tremors, <clears throat> marijuana debris in their mouth. If they've been smoking one, of course you roll your own and that kind of stuff, you may see it in the mouth. And then of course, any signs of impairment such as disoriented <clears throat> or uh, even take them out and do the modified Romberg to look for tremors and the slowed down internal clock. It is gonna be an issue. We have hemp stores in North Carolina. These are two in Raleigh. Uh, and so uh, it is gonna be a defense uh, and there's gonna be an argument. Uh, but in this case, uh, they said there was sufficient other evidence <clears throat> along with the odor of marijuana. Uh, plus we still have the cases that say that's probable cause. <clears throat> uh, this case came down Monday from the US Supreme Court and it's really not a DWI case. Uh, <clears throat> it is in fact, uh, however related, uh, the news media reported, we have two unanimous opinions from the, North Carolina, from the US Supreme Court. Well, that's true, we had a unanimous opinion in this case, but there were three concurring opinions from four justices, which said, we agree with the majority opinion as long as it's not interpreted to say this, this, or this. <laughs> so uh, what happened in this case, uh, the, uh, the petitioner, uh, Caniglia, uh, and his wife got in an argument and he had pulled out his pistol and laid it on the dining room table, said, just go ahead, shoot me and end it all. She didn't shoot him, she uh, left. <clears throat> However, the next day she couldn't get a hold of him, so she called the police for a welfare check. So the police go out there with her and find him sitting on the front porch. He agrees to go to the psychiatric hospital for an evaluation on condition that they not confiscate his firearms. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, he thought that they would, but in fact, he was smart because they are. They did. After he left, however, they entered the home without a warrant uh, and seized his firearms under the community caretaker doctrine. And the Court of Appeals for the First Circuit that ruled on it in the lower court said that that was justification. We don't want people uh, killing themselves. And the community caretaker function uh, doctrine should apply to this situation, but the U.S. Supreme Court unanimously reversed. <clears throat> However, the good thing about it is they did affirm Katie versus Dombrowski for motor vehicles. They said that, it, however, it doesn't apply to homes. Okay, they limited it to motor vehicles. That's why I brought this up. The uh, community caretaker function is still valid when you're dealing with motor vehicles. Okay but it can't be justified as for a warrantless entry of a home. <clears throat> um, but we've got, a, we've got North Carolina Court of Appeals cases that have recognized the uh, Katy case and the community caretaker. We have one where a, uh, a drunk hit a big dog and so they pulled her over uh, uh, to check on her, make sure she wasn't hurt. And they said that was okay. And we have one where a, a guy is dragging an unconscious woman into his car um, and they stopped him for that, even though that's an unconscious woman in your car is not a chapter 20 violation. Uh, and they, both cases, they upheld it. So it does apply. It just does not authorize you to enter somebody's home. However, the concurring opinions were all about exigent circumstances. That is the doctrine that'll let you warrantlessly enter a home. And uh, you need to read it. Uh, all the concurring opinions, because they said, yes, if somebody is old and they can, haven't been heard from in several days, you can enter the home under the exigent circumstances. If somebody threatens to kill themselves, you can enter the home to stop it. Uh, so there are uh, lots of things in that opinion that deal with entering homes, but for DWI purposes, community caretaker applies when you're dealing with motor vehicle operators, okay? All right, let's look at probable cause for arrest. <clears throat> this is a case that every prosecutor should have in your file, in your courtroom, okay? It does lots of good things. Uh, I came down uh, the first part of May, trooper stopped the defendant notice for an expired tag uh, and found his driver's license was revoked. So there's no bad driving, all right? During the stop, uh, the defendant deceptively denied, according to the Superior Court finding of fact, that he had been drinking. 
Why? Because the trooper testified there was a strong odor of alcohol and got two positive results on that alpha sensor. The trooper had been trained in HDN and performed the HDN 150 times. He uh, did it seated in the patrol car. Okay. He noted six of six clues. Right. He didn't remember if he did any other SFSTs or not, but there was no evidence of what they were. Okay. So we, this is what the defendant challenged. He said, that's wrong to say my client deceptively denied. He didn't deceptively deny and the court of appeals said, well, he certainly did because he lied about it <laughs> based upon the trooper's testimony and the alcohol sensor results. And so there was evidence to support the finding of fact. The uh, next he challenged the alcohol sensor because there was no documentation of calibration. Uh, oh, great. I've got a, a guy with a chainsaw out behind my house. So uh, the uh, uh, testimony of the trooper that it was calibrated is sufficient. You do not have to have actual documentation, okay? Then the uh, magic words appreciably. The ADA asked the standard question that I always ask about, do you have an opinion satisfactory to yourself as to whether you consumed, et cetera, et cetera. So it is appreciably impaired by an impairing substance. The trooper answered the question, yes, I believe he was in fact impaired, but he left out the term appreciably. Now there is no, no magic words in this, in the law, and but some judges require that term to be used. But here the court of appeals said uh, it was a mere slip of the tongue, okay? So this is a good case if the defense argues, well, judge, he never said appreciably, and they won't let you reopen it in district court. Uh, then here's a case that says, well, judge, that's a slip of the tongue. The next thing the defendant challenged was the HGN test because the trooper did not testify he was trained, ever trained to uh, do the HGN while he's seated in the patrol car. But you can see there uh, that he, uh, the court said that doesn't make any difference. He testified uh, that he had uh, trained and that it was a reliable test and therefore he can uh, testify as to the clues. So that's another good reason, but we'll see as we get through this uh, why you need this case, and this is it. The uh, defendant challenged the court's conclusion of law of probable cause, okay? Uh, here, the Court of Appeals said, the odor of alcohol on the defendant's breath and a positive alcohol sensor result is sufficient for probable cause. ADAs, how many of you have had cases where you didn't have both of those? This is enough to argue that you have probable cause. Now, look, uh, officers, I didn't say that's all the probable, all you need. No, 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 we want much more than that. And you'll always have more than that. You shouldn't arrest somebody unless you have an opinion he's impaired. So you'll always have the opinion. Uh, you'll always have uh, the SFSTs, always do that. But when it comes right down to it, prosecutors read this quote, to the judge when the defense starts whining about, well, there wasn't any bad driving, there wasn't this, there wasn't that. You've got this that says odor of alcohol, alcohol sensor results, that's all you need is probable cause, judge. Uh, so it's a great case. That's why we say that you ought to have this with you in court, decided it's a published opinion that just came down. Here's that uh, Walton case again, where they walk the dog around the uh, <coughs> car. Um, and uh, the challenge the dog not being uh, uh, probable cause because uh, he didn't have all his certifications still up to date. <clears throat> uh, the uh, court said, well, he had one uh, and that's enough. Uh, even though Burke County required all of them to be brought, kept up to date and one of them hadn't been, uh, the court said, well, the state does not require that. That was just their policy. and. So the uh, dog's training was sufficient and the alert is probable cause under the totality of the circumstances, okay? <clears throat> so that's a good probable cause case. Let's look at motions to suppress next. Again, prosecutors, this is why you ought to have the Gazelle case with you uh, in court. The uh, defendant challenged the trooper's testimony about HGM uh, claiming it was not based upon sufficient data under and uh, uh, reliable principles and methods, 
First of all, that should not be a valid challenge because there's A1, which says it's admissible if trained, but in any event, uh, the Court of Appeals didn't go there, but they did say, and prosecutors remember, the rules of evidence do not apply to motions to suppress hearings, okay? The judge has discretion to hear any kind of information, even if it would be inadmissible before a jury <clears throat> in deciding whether evidence is admissible. Uh, we got rule 104 and rule 1101 of the rules of evidence which say the rules of evidence don't apply to this. Okay, now we have a court of appeals case which specifically said the rules of evidence do not apply. So therefore, when the officer is testifying, yes, I had permission from my supervisor to set up the checking station, objection, hearsay, nope. That should come in to determine whether the checking station was in fact constitutional and the evidence is admissible. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, prosecutors that keep this Ezell case with you. <clears throat> Let's look at some of the uh, trial issues. Uh, this one came down today, also this morning. Uh, this guy forfeited his right to appointed counsel. Uh, this guy was uh, charged with DWI speeding felony, uh, uh, speeding to elude arrest, resist obstructive delay. Every time the Superior Court judge would ask him about his lawyer, he would say, I don't consent to these proceedings and I do not wish to participate. Okay, where he said, I do not understand your honor, there's still some matters I cannot get across because you interrupt me every time. <laughs> so uh, after a while, the Superior Court judge said, you forfeited your right to counsel and he did it correctly. And so they upheld his convictions. But it's just an interesting little case. <clears throat> Here we have Chambers, uh, case. This is an unpublished opinion, but here uh, uh, the uh, uh, they caught the guy with, uh, he crashed his car. Uh, they caught him with a small baggie of white substance on the ground. Uh, at trial, the defense stipulated to the training and the analysis techniques of the chemist, but refused to stipulate to the white powder as cocaine. So, uh, on appeal, so they had to bring in the analyst who testified it was cocaine, which is fine. Uh, but on appeal, uh, the defense argues, well, uh, because he stipulated his training and the techniques, the, the uh, Superior Court judge should still have required proof of the, uh, the data used and the analysis used, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the Court of Appeal said, no, uh, that stipulation was sufficient. And uh, uh, there wasn't any requirement that the court go through that analysis in Rule 702. So prosecutors, just be careful if somebody's going to stipulate. Sometimes they're stipulating you into a, an error, so make sure it's a valid, uh, a full stipulation that covers everything you need. <clears throat> this Davis case, <clears throat> excuse me, was uh, an interesting case, well done uh, by one of our uh, uh, DREs. Um, in Greensboro here, he was uh, driving his SUV, rear-ended the vehicle at high rate of speed, uh, backed up, end up on the pole, backs off, continues down, runs other cars off the road, drives through a park where kids are playing, and ends up <clears throat> crossing a basketball court and then crashes into a tree next to a creek. So this guy was really dangerous. Luckily, he didn't, uh, didn't kill anybody, uh, but here... Uh, they saw him throw liquor bottles and beer cans <laughs> into the creek after the crash. And when witness who uh, had followed him from the scene approached and she smelled a strong odor of alcohol coming from his breath. And they found him sitting in the car. So we really didn't have any issue. <clears throat> Officer Andy Reed uh, over in Greensboro, uh, a DRE and a DRE instructor, uh, of course, so he did it right, uh, did HDN on the uh, defendant while he sat on the gurney. While he was on the gurney, I don't know if he was probably laying on the gurney, six or six clues. Uh, there was a good excuse not to do the others. It's a little bit hard to do walk, walk and turn and one leg stand when you have a broken leg. So they didn't do the others on the defendant. He had mood swings, etc. cetera. Uh, he admitted drinking and taking hydrocodone. Uh, so he got charged with four counts of felony, serious injury by vehicle, four counts of hit and run involving injury <clears throat> and DWI. Uh, and you can see they uh, kept most of them. Uh, the defendant introduced evidence that he had an argument with a man who had a gun. And uh, 
who said, you want to die today? Uh, and after the crash, he did say in his drunken stupor, someone is shooting at me. Somebody's trying to kill me. Uh, and of course, the witness said there wasn't anybody there but me, and I didn't do that. So, But the issue raised on appeal was the uh, testimony of uh, Officer Reed about his qualifications to administer. Uh, and during the voir dire hearing in front of the, with the jury out, of course, He's going over all of those standard questions that the Advocates for Justice, uh, uh, the Academy of Trial Lawyers always has some people go through to try to keep HGN out, uh, which they don't wanna ask them in front of the jury because the way they'll answer them, of course, makes the HGN sound much better. So he's asking them during that, uh, he started going into all of this and finally the Superior Court judge said, well, now you're supposed to ask him on board here only about his qualifications <clears throat> and not all of this other stuff. So he accepted him as a uh, uh, expert and the court of appeals found this was not an error. Now the defendant raised on appeal, and I don't know that this is appropriate, raised on appeal, uh, the testimony of Officer Reed about a 1998 study that showed uh, the decisions made solely on HGN that the person was impaired at a 0.08 or higher 88% of the time. Okay, we do that to qualify him. And uh, <clears throat> he was, of course, familiar with them. Uh, the defendant argued that Officer Rita effectively told the jury that based upon the results, HGN, that there was an 88% chance my client had a 0.08 or higher, and that violates <clears throat> the rate, the statute which says you cannot testify as to a particular alcohol concentration. <clears throat> the uh, uh, Court of Appeals did not say the admission testimony was error, but said assuming it was error, it was not plain error, there was no objection to it. <clears throat> Why? Because the defense was the one that brought it out. <clears throat> but uh, they said it was not plain error. What gets me about it is this was on voir dire. The rules of evidence don't apply. The jury didn't hear it. It's no harm. And the court didn't even mention the fact that it was not in front of the jury, <clears throat> which they should have. But in any event, uh, I just bring this out, ADAs, you need to be careful. If you're covering this in front of a jury uh, to avoid the terms uh, studies and 0.08 or higher coming out. Uh, I just think if you're asking for, well, you're giving the defense something to argue. <clears throat> I, I don't know that it, uh, if uh, uh, if you testify to this, that that's error in front of a jury, uh, but it gives the defense something to argue on appeal, and you may want to just avoid it when it's not necessary, uh, especially when you got a good witness who can testify about how good HDN is. <clears throat> uh, in this case, they also said uh, whiplash and pinched nerves can be serious injury. And so when you're doing <clears throat> injury cases, this is a good case to have. I won't go over it, but uh, you can say it was pretty bad uh, whiplash and pretty bad pinched nerves uh, that these individuals suffered when he rear-ended them. Uh, but they upheld all of his convictions. <clears throat> uh, he was arguing necessity and wanted jury instructions on necessity. Uh, the uh, problem was that he didn't, it's a, an affirmative defense, which the defense has to establish. And here there was no evidence uh, that uh, anybody with a gun was chasing him when he rear-ended all those people and left the scene, et cetera. <clears throat> in fact, uh, the argument on appeal was that there was a black SUV that followed him. Well, the black SUV that followed him was a witness who was following him when he was leaving the scene, and there was no evidence that the defendant even saw the black SUV. But uh, So the uh, court said necessity instructions are not properly, uh, re are not required, they're properly denied. So uh, that was a good case. <clears throat> Here we have uh, uh, a uh, interesting case that ended up with multiple counties, uh, felony hit and run, two counts, uh, CNR and uh, being a habitual felon. Here, <clears throat> the defendant was riding in a van with a U-Haul trailer behind it on I-40 out in Iredale County. Uh, apparently, he and a couple of motorcyclists uh, got into some sort of confrontation, he made rude gestures, flipped off two motorcyclists, spit at them. Uh, later, he cut off the two motorcyclists and required, uh, caused one of them to crash. 
Now the motorcyclist testified that survived, uh, testified that he don't know, he didn't know if he actually had contact with his U-Haul trailer or not, uh, but it caused him to uh, uh, lose control and he uh, wrecked his vehicle. His bike went down and his fiance who was a passenger was killed. <clears throat> I'm not sure what happened with the, uh, with the death case, but uh, this is just the serious injury. So uh, uh, he uh, slows down, uh, then takes off. The driver does. The other cyclist who was not involved, didn't lose control, uh, chases him. They go down 40 to where I-77 intersects in Statesville and he apparently goes off on I-77 uh, at 100 miles an hour. Well, the motorcyclist pulls out his gun and shoots out the tire uh, on the uh, 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 van, I mean, on the U-Haul. Uh, uh, he then uh, uh, is told to return to the scene by the highway patrol. Uh, so later the van operator continues to drive and later has, uh, he can't even change the tire. He has called AAA, come out and change his tire and told him, well, he just hit something and it messed up his tire. But then he asked the uh, 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 guys there, how can I go to Banner Elk without driving on any interstate? <clears throat> uh, the AAA guy then learned about the crash and uh, gave the highway patrolman the uh, tag number <clears throat> of the van. And the van and the trailer were later located in Banner Elk and the defendant surrendered. <clears throat> um, and uh, there was serious injury to one operator and of course his fiance died. So the question is, is there hidden, is there sufficient evidence of hit and run <clears throat> when there is no contact? And the uh, court of appeal said, yes. <clears throat> the defense argued that, well, the trailer was behind him. He couldn't see if somebody uh, wrecked or not. Uh, but the court of appeal said, well, he slowed down <clears throat> and uh, following the crash and then immediately took off. That's pretty good evidence. So uh, they said there was sufficient evidence that he knew he was involved in a crash involving serious injury uh, and upheld that. Uh, they then uh, challenged the use of uh, jury instructions of flight as consciousness of guilt. And he claimed that, well, in a hit and run, uh, you always have the running part, so flight's not a valid uh, consideration uh, because it's part of the hit and run. <clears throat> but the court said no. Uh, as you can see, the flight requires some evidence taking steps to avoid apprehension. Here he sped away, later lied about what happened with his tire, and later asked for directions to avoid being uh, found on the interstates, uh, how to get to Banneret. So all of that justified flight as an ind indication of consciousness of guilt, and uh, the jury instructions were appropriate. <clears throat> um, this next one. Uh, is uh, uh, down in Monkey Junction, which is down in Wilmington. For those of you who haven't been down that way, uh, here, uh, this guy, a driver, was having difficulty maintaining lanes, crossed the median, drove on the wrong side of the highway. Uh, as he comes up to a stoplight where people are stopped, uh, he hits the last vehicle in the lane, a Hyundai Sonata. Some, <clears throat> uh, and uh, the estimate was 43 miles per hour in a 45 mile per hour zone. So he didn't even slow down. Uh, in the vehicle was uh, being driven by Ms. Williams. She was pregnant, was occupied by her and her two young kids, both of whom were in child safety seats, but one of them died as a result of blunt force trauma. So we have a, a death charge. <clears throat> um, here, the, they find the defendant, he's unresponsive, slumped over the wheel. Uh, the deputy who pulls him out to render aid, he observed heroin bundles uh, and uh, a Narcan kit that the guy was carrying himself and then needles. Uh, so uh, another deputy administered Narcan to him via the nasal spray twice with no effect. Uh, they gave him two more intravenously and he woke up. So <coughs> uh, they did what they were supposed to. Here they took blood at the hospital. Uh, they found uh, drugs in his system, but no op opioids by the time they got there. Uh, and the forensic toxicologist testified <clears throat> that uh, sometimes they 
low dose drugs such as fentanyl are effective in small concentrations and that's why they didn't have them. Uh, they, uh, and they're hard to detect uh, and the court said in the State Bureau of Investigations instruments. But we all know the State Crime Lab is not part of the SBI, okay? <clears throat> but the only issue raised, actually raised on appeal was the two autopsy photographs of the victim in this case uh, to illustrate the medical examiner's testimony and they said they were not, uh, uh, that two is okay. Uh, there weren't too many of them. They weren't used inappropriately as they can be. So it wasn't a, uh, they upheld the convictions of the defendant. Um, this uh, drug impaired driving case, uh, I'll go through it fairly quickly, uh, running out of time and uh, I wanna cover the rest of these, but uh, uh, here, uh, erratic vehicle driving, uh, across the yellow line. Uh, there was an ambulance out there who actually stopped. Uh, the defendant claimed that she was on her way to get dog food, had trouble keeping her eyes open because she'd gotten her home sprayed for bed bugs and uh, it was uh, hurting her eyes. <clears throat> However, and she'd been poisoned, but she refused to uh, see the EMT. Uh, the defendant uh, had very slow movements, denied she'd been drinking or taking any medication. Uh, the uh, uh, sergeant tried to give an HGN test, but she wouldn't keep her eyes open. <laughs> so he couldn't observe any clues. <clears throat> However, on the walk and turn, uh, she had difficulty from the starting position. Uh, she stated she had problems with her knee and her hip, et cetera, to do the walk and turn on the one leg stand. Uh, she uh, had to use an arm for balance, hopping in place, et cetera, four out of four clues. <clears throat> Um, on uh, that case, uh, that uh, SFST. Um, and she said she took an oxycodone last night, but she was not being affected here. <clears throat> so they uh, go down the area, goes through implied consent, she refuses. So we get to search warrant. Uh, and then she says, okay, you can take my blood. Uh, so uh, what did they find? Oh yeah, they found a few things in her system. You can see hydrocodone, diazepam, noradiazepam, dihydrochloride, and all them others. You can see <clears throat> basically opiates, uh, and uh, that's why she was having her problems. So the, uh, uh, the jury found her guilty of DWI and failing to maintain lane control. Okay, so she goes out, she comes back in, gives, doesn't get her appeal done right, but they help her out. <clears throat> so uh, uh, they take the case. And the good thing about this conviction was firm based upon drugs in the blood and bad driving. We've got odor of alcohol and bad driving. Now we've got a case, blood in the dr drugs in the blood and bad driving is a prima facie case sufficient to convict, okay? And they did say giving the uh, refusal instructions was correct, even though she consented later, <clears throat> she initially refused. They got the search warrant and then she consented uh, you know, the court said you should give the jury instructions on refusal being evidence of guilt, and the jury can decide with all of the circumstances whether that is valid uh, indication of guilt. <clears throat> this case, Miss Sarah Garner uh, and uh, Aaron Berlin, uh, who are TSRPs, of course, uh, got this second degree murder conviction, which the Court of Appeals said six years. Uh, died, uh, violated his speedy trial rights, even though the defense attorney said he intentionally delayed it because he was trying to get his client to plead. Uh, but the new North Carolina Supreme Court will review this case. So uh, if you got some old vehicular homicide cases, <clears throat> hopefully this one will be reversed. Sensing issues, failure to give notice of aggravating circumstance. Here the uh, state did give notice when, you know, when you go to a from district court, superior court, you got to file that notice. Here, the notice they gave was especially dangerous and especially reckless driving. <clears throat> there was a 1991 DWI conviction, which is not a grossly aggravating factor, but would be could be aggravating. That's the one the judge in superior court picked as the aggravator, as opposed to the ones the state gave notice on. And so the court of appeal said, well, too bad. It comes back from a level four to a level five. So uh, just make sure that you check them all because never tell them which one the uh, Superior Court judge will pick. <clears throat> and uh, prosecutors, again, I know it's easy to get uh, 
uh, lulled into things when you think you, uh, when everybody's talking, but here you've got to introduce in Superior Court uh, the um, driving record or the criminal history, whatever you're using to prove uh, their criminal record for purposes of sentencing, unless you get a stipulation from the defendant. And that is an actual stipulation, not that he didn't object. Okay. So in this case, they handed the printed conviction, uh, the criminal history to the judge, which I would think means that it was introduced, but they never formally introduced it. And the court of appeal said, nope, new sentencing hearing required. At least they get to do it again and they'll do it this time. <clears throat> Um, this is the one I want to make sure we cover. State versus Scott, they, the North Carolina Supreme Court reversed this decision. Now, this is the one that where the uh, <clears throat> there was a crash. Um, the ADA obtained a court order for the blood from the hospital taken for treatment. Three vials of blood were obtained, and the crime lab showed a 22. Uh, <clears throat> the ED, EDR showed 78 and a 45. Etc. and he got convicted of second degree murder. Uh, they unanimously ruled that the uh, <clears throat> uh, court order getting the medical records was inappropriate because the ADA did not have an affidavit attached to it. <clears throat> Although the statute just says all you have to do is you're involved in a crash, you can get them through a court order or a search warrant. But the court of appeal said, no, uh, you got to have uh, reasonable suspicion for a court order or probable cause for a search warrant. That was unanimous. The uh, majority, however, said because of the 0 .22 was harmless error, which was what is in the medical records, because of the reckless driving and the speeding, et cetera. One judge dissented, the North Carolina Supreme Court reversed, saying that the wrong standard for uh, the harmless error was placed on the defendant to prove it rather than the state to show it was harmless error. And so they reversed it and sent it back down. However, they did not reverse, did not rule, did not change the original ruling that you got to have reasonable suspicion for a court order or probable cause for a search warrant to get medical records. That is still the law. So make sure you have affidavits to support it uh, before you go after the medical records. I just want to make sure you didn't think suddenly we got out from under Scott. We didn't. And there is my contact information <clears throat> if anybody wants to contact me. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing. I think I am almost right on time. Ike, thank you so much. What an excellent and uh, detailed presentation uh, today. So we really appreciate uh, all the great information you've provided. Mm -hmm. um, we are at, at our normal um, end time right now. Um, if, the, if anyone does have a, um, a a um, urgent question, a burning question that like that they'd like to uh, go ahead and ask Ike. Uh, I would actually just to uh, ask folks to raise your hand, and I'll um, call on you to for that. Um, it, but if you, of course, if you've already started typing in the Q and A, feel free to continue typing, um, Ike. And uh, while we uh, wait for any um, uh, questions here, uh, let me do ask you one follow up question. Uh, here at the end, how can the state obtain medical records to determine if the driver was impaired when only the evidence, uh, when the only evidence is a crash? Okay. Uh, in other words, what can you, uh, how can you have reasonable suspicion for a court order or probable cause for, <clears throat> for a search warrant to get those medical records under that Scott case? Uh, well, the medical records tell a lot more than just impairment. Uh, they will tell who was the driver based upon uh, uh, injuries. Uh, you need to uh, take uh, do an affidavit on why you think those medical records will in fact present you with legitimate evidence, such as we have a single vehicle crash, unexplained reason for the crash, uh, and therefore, uh, uh, there's suspicion that uh, there was an impairing uh, substance in the driver uh, when he crashed. Something along that line, uh, if you need probable cause, uh, look at his, do a further investigation. Look for people who were out with him that night. Yes, we saw him drinking and driving, and then you have 
Uh, you got evidence of the odor of alcohol or drinking, consuming alcohol and bad driving because he had a wreck. That should be probable cause to get yourself a warrant for the medical records. You just need to make sure there's an affidavit that will establish probable cause or reasonable suspicion, depending on which way you go, and not just rely on that statute uh, that says you don't need that. You just need uh, a court order or, or a search warrant. But uh, the Court of Appeals said reasonable suspicion or probable cause. Ike, thank you very much uh, for sure. that response. Uh, we don't have any hands showing. I uh, don't have any questions in queue. Um, so I'm going to presume that everybody uh, either got everything you uh, um, um, asked. Oh, uh, the um, uh, we did have a po question pop up to uh, get uh, contact email. Yes, uh, uh, we can uh, provide additional contact information in the follow up email. Um, so thank you uh, very much for that question. So because we're running a, a little past our normal allotted time, Ike, I'm going to go ahead and wrap us up for today. Um, so we want to thank you again very much for an excellent presentation. I want to thank Sarah Garner as well, again, and everyone who joined us today. If you were unable to uh, have time to get your question answered, um, let us know. Go ahead and put it in the Q&A uh, window here, and we'll try to get a response uh, for you after the webinar. And before you leave, also use the Q&A window to help to share any suggestions you may have to help us improve this webinar series, including any future topics you'd like to learn about. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, following today's webinar, you're going to receive an email with the link to the recording as soon as it's available, so be sure and watch for that. In that same email, if you are interested in receiving a certificate uh, for your participation, there will be a link in that email where you can request a certificate. Uh, I will note if you are happening to be watching this recording right now, uh, only attendees in the live webinar are eligible to receive uh, a certificate. Uh, last, we want to invite you to join us again for other traffic safety webinars that we have planned for in this series. Uh, you'll find uh, a listing of all those webinars. Uh, we have at least a dozen more, I think, in this series planned for this year. Uh, you'll find them at the link um, you see there on your screen. On that same page, you'll find information about our next North Carolina Traffic Safety Conference uh, and Expo, which is going to be held in August 2022. Uh, we hope you will plan to attend that conference. We also invite you to propose topics uh, for any presentations at that conference. Uh, there's a link on the website uh, called Presentation Proposals that you can uh, submit your ideas. Uh, so again, with that, I want to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar. And until next time, goodbye for now.